Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. First bailout, which was back in, you know, bailout with quotes around it back in 2010. And, you know, unequivocally, this is the single worst point in Greek history. And history goes back quite a ways economically, financially, socially, uh, as far as the social unrest. Politically, it's uh, it's in chaos. And of course, the people that are trying to administer this austerity to them may not even be around much longer. I mean, there's the the, the, the troika of the IMF and the the ECB and the European Commission. I mean, they're they're fighting their own battles to stay around. Their massive internal battles over policies and immigration and and monetary policy, and of course, all these elections, starting with the Dutch election last week, which could literally end their reign of terror before they even get to the point of a, a Greek bailout. But of course, Greece is going to is going to is going to exit from the European Union and default on. I think it is 450 billion euros of debt and another like 200 billion off balance sheet. Of course, they're going to default on it, just like all the other pigs and uh, some of the you know less piggy pigs. Like well, I used to call it the pigs because I, I lumped France in there. And I think you're going to see some of the first world nations uh, defaulting on debt either through uh, probably actual defaults because they won't they may not be an ECB to hyperinflate it in the in the coming years. So, I mean, you talk about the EU and all these different votes. I mean, we have the the Netherlands, the Nexit, the Frexit, the Grexit, the Swexit. I mean, we have tons of them. I mean, a lot of them are coming up right now, uh, starting in March, going throughout this year and into 2018. A lot of people saying that the EU is not even going to exist moving forward. Is that what you're seeing also? You don't think the EU will exist? I don't think that there's going to be a troika to administer uh, any any kind of bailouts, even if uh, they wanted to, because of the internal infighting and potentially the end of the, the European Union. And look, the European Union, everyone wants to believe, oh, it can't possibly happen. It's this big entity. The uh, the European currency has only been around for 18 years, and it's basically, you know, at a just about at a 15-year low. In fact, we might hit that 15-year low today, uh, the way things are looking. So we're talking about you know, people are unhappy. That's why the Brexit occurred. I mean, that's why Trump was elected. People are unhappy any, everywhere, but particularly in Europe because of the dysfunction of the uh, of the European Union and, of course, the immigration crisis caused by the crash of oil uh, and all the wars in the Middle East that have all the people, you know, uh, emigrating out of the Middle East into Europe, which is right there. So I, I think it's it's inevitable I mean, look, we've had so far, you know, we had the Catalonian vote. And by the way, the Catalonian final secession vote right now, I think, is scheduled for September. I mean, I don't know why no one talks about this. That's a quarter of all of Spain and its wealthiest, highest tax paid and paying region. And September is only a few months from now. And Spain has one of the worst financial situations in all of Europe. Uh, but yes, before that, we have the Dutch election uh, next week. Uh, it's pretty obvious Geert Wilders, who's the uh, anti-Euro, anti-EU candidate, is going to win. They say he needs to uh, form a coalition government, so he may not be able to call for a Netherlands exit uh, You know, vote. Uh, that remains to be seen. I have a feeling that if he wins, he's going to have a lot more power than people think. But more importantly, that's that's nothing. The big one is France. Uh, we're not even going to talk about Italy because they haven't announced the snap elections yet, but now that the Democratic Party there just collapsed last week with Renzi uh, resigning. They're going to have to call them soon. And of course, the German elections, which won't be as draconian as what's going to happen in some of the other places, uh, but will definitely have a big impact because Angela Merkel and her ruling Christian Democrats are going to get swept out as well. But the big one is, of course, France. Uh, and the, that's a two round election. The first one is in April and then there's a second round in May. It's pretty obvious that Marine Le Pen will be through the first round. And the only question is, can she fight through the propaganda that's out there, just just like the anti-Brexit and the anti-Trump propaganda to to win the second round? And I think she's going to shock everyone. I mean, look, they gave Trump the day of the election 20 percent odds and the Brexit 
30 percent odds a day of the vote. And they're uh, above 30 percent for her right now, which shows you they're having trouble holding down her chances. I think the popular support and the level of financial and social uh, dysfunction in France is going to is going to lead her to a, a dramatic victory. And she will call call for a Frexit and uh, getting out of the euro entirely. And, you know, these are the kind of things that can quickly spiral out of control for the entire continent. So when these countries actually leave, let's talk about what happens afterwards. Uh, they're going to go back to their own currencies. I don't think they've thought it out. Well, yeah, I mean, she has a plan. You know, the plan is to have some new franc, and I'm sure she's got all kinds of bells and whistles to try to hide the fact that it's, you know, it's going to be worth dramatically less than the euro itself and is going to, you know, be unable to pay back its debts. Uh, but, yeah, that's that's the only option. Go back to national currencies. And, again, the, the whole, it's the whole problem with the euro is, uh, is that it enabled countries – with lesser financial prospects to have more highly valued currencies. And when they go back to their uh, original currencies, they're going to have a lot less purchasing power. And that includes the French franc. I mean, France is a financial basket case. Uh, and France, by the way, is you know one of the biggest creditors of all these pigs nations that are going to default. Uh, and of course, as the euro continent falls apart, starting with the Brexit, which they're going to actually formally do later this year, trade's going to fall off in a big way. And they're going to have even further uh, problems uh, in, in paying back their debts. But again, you know, once that vote occurs, all else is going to fall in line because there's going to be chaos that ensues if she wins. And again, just like the Brexit, just like the Trump, they are maintaining their best uh, propagandists bent to pretend she can't win. I mean, but think about it. Her main competition going into this uh, was this guy, Francois Filon, who was the, he was at one point the prime minister himself. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I never even heard of the guy. But now he's involved in this huge embezzlement scandal where he was stealing EU funds to give jobs to his wife and kids and pay him money. So he's out. He's going to lose. So, of course, they have to come up quick with a new candidate to say that it's going to beat uh, Marine Le Pen. And it's incredible. They came up. Remember, the reason that they're having this uh, this crazy election is because Francois Holland who's a one term president who's not even running running for reelection because he has the lowest ever approval ratings in the history of modern France. His finance minister, this guy, Macron, uh, is all of a sudden now the new leading candidate. He's 39 years old, if you could believe it. He's been in office for like three years, ran France into the ground under Francois Holland. And by the way, his background is total silver spoon, rich kid, investment banker, all that kind of stuff. And they're trying to convince these angry people in France that this guy is somehow going to beat Marine Le Pen, which is not going to happen. So uh, do you think investors will then rush into uh, gold or silver when uh, countries start to leave the EU? Yes. I mean, I, they're, they're going to be rushing out of euros is what they're going to be doing. It's going to. How about you the know, dollar? I mean, yeah, well, I said all along, you know, crisis in the world causes the dollar to go up because it's the most liquid currency. It has nothing to do with dollars, with U.S. economic strength or military strength. It's the reserve currency and therefore it's the most liquid. And that's why while well, all these people, even in my sector for years, have been saying, well, gold's going to go up because the, the dollar is going to go down. No, the dollar's purchasing power will go down against gold. Uh, when it's not manipulated as much, but not against other fiat currencies because it's the strongest fiat currency. It's the reserve currency. And so it keeps going up and up. And the more crisis you have, the more the dollar will go up, as it always does during crisis, which is the, you know, it's the, the two edged sword, because what it does is it crushes America's competitiveness even more. And, and more and more importantly, it crushes the currencies of the world, which are already, for the most part, at all time lows. I mean, look what's going on today. Like I said about the euro, it just makes it makes their inflation and their inability uh, to pay back their monstrous debts that much starker. So, you know, it's a vicious loop that will only uh, feed on itself. And of course, part of that money is going to go into gold and silver. I mean, it always does. It always has throughout history and always will. And the only thing between the, uh, you know, the all time highs we had years ago and where we are now is that manipulation. And of course, in other currencies, Prices are a lot closer to the all-time highs. I mean, in euros, it's only about 15% from the all-time high compared to 35% over here because of the manipulation. So I think you're going to see a dramatic change as the historic, I mean, historic bubbles in financial assets, historic valuations like nothing ever seen before, 1929, 2000, 2008, you name it, are going to pop 
certainly in real terms, maybe not in nominal terms if they if they actually go the route of hyperinflation. But um, you know, a lot of that money is going to flee this risk trade, this ridiculous Trumpflation meme that's never going to come true. Uh, it can't. It can't mathematically come true, and it's going to go into safe haven assets. Uh, you talk about uh, precious metals popping. We see Bitcoin right now uh, is making strong moves up. And recently we've seen silver. Well, that was completely slammed down by like two billion of notional uh, silver into the future pits. And there was also like what I mean, it was like 23,000 silver future contracts that were dumped that brought silver down and, and not so much as uh, for gold. But we see that they're still suppressing gold and silver i mean what are they so worried about well they're they're worried about exactly what i'm talking about here and you know look i wrote the other day an article called the 200 day moving a uh, 200 week moving average war which is exactly what's going on against gold and silver they were you know i'm going to talk about not 200 day 200 weeks that's a huge technical level and for gold it's about 1260 uh, and for silver, it's about 1860 per ounce. And that's, a, you know, exactly where those those uh, where they were trading the night of the election. Hence the need to go into this massive smash down mode. Remember, the, they were above those let those those averages from 2003 all the way up until April 2013, when you had that massive smash in April, the day after Obama had his unprecedented closed door meeting with all the too big to fail bank CEOs. And for four years, they pushed prices down. And they've uh, been able to, you know, push ahead this this hyperinflationary meme for 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 you know four more years. But here we are with gold and silver right back up at those levels, and they literally t- kissed those levels last Tuesday. Uh, gold was actually at twelve sixty four, which is exactly what that number is, and silver was like at eighteen fifty five. And then, sure enough, as you said, it was two point seven billion dollars worth of notional silver hit the comics uh, right right around the open, and of course. You know, got the ball rolling, you know, the record commercial shorts, meaning government shorts. And, you know, here we are in another sell cycle. And it was coincident with the Fed coming out with, you know, the most inane, you know, policy change ever. Just, you know, we were at uh, we were at post-election interest rate lows and all the data was horrible. And then all of a sudden on Tuesday, they start coming out saying, we're going to raise rates. We're going to raise rates. We're going to raise rates. And this is at the same time as their own GDP model for the first quarter has been pushed down to 1.3%, and all the hard data has has you know is just rolling over everywhere. I mean, Germany had minus seven percent uh, industrial production in January. I mean, we're talking about the, it's incredible how much effort has gone in to quelling gold and silver before they break through those levels. And here we are a week later, uh, and now interest rates are surging, which is going to kill the economy, and the dollar is surging, which is going to kill the economy. But they have pushed gold and silver away temporarily from those levels, and you know, just like they did after the election, they will rebound and come right back again and challenge them until eventually they break free. And as for Bitcoin, I mean, people who listen to me know I, I mean, I just wrote another article this weekend called, uh, you know, Bitcoin and gold, same as it ever was in, in a re- rapidly changing world. I mean, people are looking for safe haven assets and governments which are historically terrified about gold and silver because of the threat they pose now have to contend with bitcoin as well because it's an, another alternative form of wealth preservation that they don't know anything about so you know like you see this morning the chinese are still not allowing withdrawals of bitcoin from their their exchanges under the guise of anti-money laundering it's the same kind of thing they are terrified of the threats to anything that's you know that that threatens their their paper currencies that they're that are being destroyed and the you know and the the catch 22 is they have to keep destroying those currencies or else the gig you know ends immediately so yeah you're going to see more and more moving of assets out of of uh of overvalued uh markets and manipulated markets and into safe havens and that's inexorable and unstoppable. Yeah, you mentioned um, inflation and you mentioned Germany, Spain, uh, the U.S., and we see inflation is, is moving up. Do you, do you think the Fed is going to be able to control inflation or do you think inflation is just going to run away and they're going to completely lose control over it? Well, as long as they print money uh, at the rate they're doing it, there's going to be higher inflation. But of course, you know, that inflation right now, because the velocity of money remains really low, uh, because people have been, you know, hoodwinked into believing the, the the manipulations of the markets. They haven't had that fear yet because they see the Dow at an all-time high. But the fact is, it certainly crept into the cost of living in a big way. 
Uh, certainly over here, our cost of living is exploding. And, uh, and that's nothing compared to all the other currencies around the world who are watching. You know, if you're in Europe, the, the euro is down from 1.6 to 1.05. I mean, and that's the second biggest currency in the world. So we're talking about, you know, major, major increases in inflation around the world, even more so than here. And, uh, you know, all the money printing is, 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 is slowly causing it to increase here. And, of course, it's rapidly hyperinflating our bubble markets. But, you know, once you have any kind of crisis and what's amazing is with all the terrible things going on politically, economically, socially, monetarily, because this hyper crazy manipulation of markets, we haven't really had a crisis in like a year's time. We haven't even had a 1% drop in the S&P 500 in, I don't know, six months or a 10% drop in, in more than a year. So people still have enough confidence that they're not racing out of uh, dollars and into safe haven assets. Uh, certainly not at the clip that they're going to be. But I mean, of course, we're going to have a crisis one of these days, whether it's uh, because of France or because the Federal Reserve are raising uh, rates and causing, you know, what's already, you know, all these interest rate sensitive businesses are already falling apart and they'll only get worse if they keep doing this. So, you know, some catalyst is going to cause even the greatest manipulation ever to be overcome. And when it does, you're going to see uh, a crisis of confidence in the currencies, especially because at some point the Fed itself is going to have to reverse course and do what all the other central banks in the world are doing, which is to go back on the uh, hyper monetary inflation trail. You know, it's funny you mentioned um, the Dow, the S&P 500 not having a correction. We hear from Bank of America, Citibank, JP Morgan, and many others, uh, many other individuals out there saying that uh, the second half of this year, things are going to rapidly fall apart. Actually, uh, Bank of America, Citi, and JP, they're telling people to sell off right now. Is that your take on it too, that we haven't had any type of crisis or anything come up that it's coming? We haven't had a crisis, and of course there's going to be one coming. I mean, there's always crises. The thing is, that's so crazy is there are crises. I mean, major political and economic crises everywhere and currencies have been crashing serially. And now, you know, the Trump administration itself is at war with America uh, and with the liberals. You know, I mean, it's there's so much actual crisis going on. But because of the incredible amount of manipulation of all financial markets, which I mean, look, I, I put a chart today in my uh, article showing how, you know, how the Dow was tracking economic data uh, perfectly, uh, at least the rigged economic data, until the day of the election when all of a sudden they completely broke apart because that was when the powers that be were, you know, they were taken by surprise by the election. They said, we got to go full out. So it's at the point where they've created bubbles with valuations higher than any time in, in U.S. history. Uh, at a time of the worst economic situation in U.S. history. So, yes, of course, we're going to have a, a crisis. And that crisis may not even start in the United States. I mean, believe me, Marine Le Pen wins. You know, I said when Trump wins, it'll be Brexit times 10. She wins, it'll be Brexit times 100. So last time you were on, um, Trump was just uh, inaugurated. And, you know, after that, he was promising, you know, jobs from many, many different companies. The latest one is from Exxon promising 45,000 jobs. Do you think this is still possible to create all these jobs, bring manufacturing back under the certain, un, un, under the circumstances right now? Well, they were all lying. I mean, they're, they're not, all these companies for publicity, they just say, yeah, we're going to do stuff and then they're not going to, first of all, like, you know, automakers, they're going to build, what, they're going to build plants in America that are unprofitable just to appease Donald Trump. Of course, these things aren't going to happen. I'm not sure where you heard that about Exxon. Exxon is one of the biggest basket cases in the entire econo uh, financial community. I mean, they're 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 basically not barely profitable, if that at all. It's certainly, when you you know they're massively cash flow negative right now, so to the point that they've had to massively increase their debt just to pay their dividends, uh, and their capex is collapsing. And now that the oil price is look, I mean, I, I told you, I've been an oil analyst. That's what I did my prior life. And I've been railing against this fake lie of a OPEC production cut forever. And sure enough, with each passing day, there's more and more evidence uh, that this historic, I'm talking about historic and irreversible oil glut is getting worse. And so, you know, at $50 a barrel, which is we're almost down there uh, again now, that's the oil PPTs line in the sand. Uh, you know, you're talking about dramatic cutbacks still for Exxon. And when we go below 50 again, I mean, we're going to talk about massive layoffs and and uh, and CapEx cuts and all those kind of things. So I'm not sure where 
why Exxon of all companies would be, I think they're going to be having mass layoffs over the coming years. And, you know, again, a lot of these other companies that say they're going to do stuff, they're going to do, they're going to just, they meet Trump for half an hour and say, yeah, we're going to make American jobs. So they think it'll make their stock go up and maybe they'll get some tax favors. But that, you know, saying you're going to do something, especially something that's not economically viable for your own interests and actually doing it are two different things. So what do you think his strategy is just to keep going to companies and say, hey, listen, you're going to bring jobs back? Yes, we are. I mean, eventually people are going to start, you know, scratching their heads saying, OK, there are no jobs coming back. I mean, we made all these promises and here we are months later. There's nothing. So what's his strategy? What's the end game here? Well, his strategy was to become president. And he did it like just as Obama and every other pro candidate becomes president. They say, this is what's wrong with the other administration that, that you know, so vote for me. And one of them is there's no jobs, so I'm going to get jobs. And, you know, and again, you know, you think about those job uh, announcements. They all came like right in the first week of the presidency or right before the inauguration because he was just doing more political campaigning, you know, like to get everyone all excited and let me meet people and saying, but the fact is these things are not politically or economically feasible uh, for these companies to add jobs. So they're not going to just like, again, you know, he made a bunch of promises and I, who am completely apolitical, but I spent a great deal of my, you know, I write every day of my efforts saying we cannot let Hillary Clinton win, or, or should I say, Trump, you have to vote for Trump. Uh, but I said the day after I did an audio plug, it was like the day after the election called turning on Trump. I said, OK, he's in. Thank God Hillary is not. But here's the reasons why not a thing that he promised is possible, starting with the repeal of Obamacare. And, if you know, I was talking this morning about, you know, the details of this horrifying uh, Trump care proposal. It is as bad or worse than Obamacare. There's not a shred of I difference. Uh, and then, of course, there's he's got to get, you know, he wants fiscal stimulus. And by the way, that fiscal stimulus pales in comparison to what China did. And look where China is today. They, the, the premier at their National Congress this weekend said this is going to be the worst year of growth pretty much in modern Chinese history. Uh, and their debt is exploding. And that's the same thing here. He can't get any fiscal plans of any kind. And, and oh, yeah, Next week, I mean, less than a week where or one week is the debt ceiling hits. So he said that I can't do any infrastructure or tax reform plans until I get a, a clarity on the on the health care issue. But after this proposal on health care, it's clear that that issue is never going to be clarified. And of course, with the debt ceiling, how are you going to get any infrastructure or tax reform proposals? The point is, all these things were simply campaign promises. Obama promises hope and change. He promises his version of hope and change. And look where we are. There's no hope and change eight years later. And the things that he wants, again, it's nothing against him personally. He, you could put anyone in the office. It doesn't matter. All those things were dead on arrival the second that he announced them. But people are just so angry at what's going on that they that they uh, that they elected a great disruptor. And the point is, he's going to be he's already under attack uh, from from. I mean, America's attacking him, let alone, you know, all the trade and economic and diplomatic wars that are being flared up everywhere. Uh, and I assure you, if the dollar goes up any further, it's going to get a lot crazier, uh, at, let alone if interest rates go with it, because the Fed is insane enough to, to raise them. I and mean, look, you know, right now the interest rates are surging. This is going to have catastrophic near term impact on uh, on, 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 a, on a nation that had one and a half percent GDP growth in the fourth quarter and now is in danger of being below one percent in the first quarter. So, yeah, you know, his strategy was to get elected president. And uh, whether his, I mean, I'm sure his intentions were good, but, he, you know, he's in office for two two months and it's already clear, probably more to, in, including to him, that there's absolutely nothing he could do to stop this runaway train. And when the debt ceiling debacle starts next week and when the elections start rolling in uh, in Europe and, and, you know, God forbid, if interest rates and the dollar keep rising, which will remember corporate earnings in this country have been down six quarters in a row. What will surging interest rates in the dollar do there? For And again, we have bubble-like valuations, <laughs> the stock market on top of it. So, you know, his tweets, he's going to be a lot more conservative with his tweets soon about how great he is because he's about to run into a brick wall of reality. So, Andy, wh what does the U.S. have to do? What does the government have to do to set things right where we can have growth, where the U.S. can become another manufacturing superpower. Is it possible? No, it's not. I mean, that's the whole point of this. this I mean, without Trump, I mean, what what do you think has to be done? And, you know, I say this, I've been saying this for a long time. The thing that, that makes me the craziest, it's not you, but when people in general 
Uh, I mean, look, people are trying to be optimistic and they're trying to get, uh, you know, listeners in the mainstream. But just to say, well, things are bad. So if we just do this, we'll fix it. I mean, there are things that are right choices versus wrong choices. But the, the big issue is the debt has to default. It's unpayable. There are structural problems in the economy that will never be fixed, such as demographics and the lack of competitiveness with six billion other people around the world, let alone, the, you know, the ridiculous uh, policies, monetary and fiscal that are going on. And now we're going to initiate trade wars that that's really going to help. So, no, there's nothing to do. The system needs to die and then needs to, to restart without the manipulation, without the central banks, without the draconian government decrees, which, of course, you know, I mean, that's going to take some time to get to. But no, there's nothing to fix it. He can make choices that are better than others, like don't institute trade tariffs. Uh, or the Fed could just butt out and stop messing around with interest rates. I mean, these are correct choices versus the alternative, but they're really Hobson's choices because if you don't do it, you know, if you do it, you're damned. And if you don't do it, you're damned as well. So I think to me, it's always been, you know, even going back to 2008 when I wanted Ron, Ron Paul to win, I said, well, the system is screwed. I just want a good diplomat in there, someone who can be a good steward as we get through this this uh, this this canyon of financial and economic hell with a, a minimum of disruption. And, uh, you know, here we had the choices of of uh, of the great disruptor Trump and Hillary Clinton, who wanted World War Three with Russia. So, you know, I don't think we're you know, I mean, I, I don't think there's really anything you could do except for protect yourself and hope for the best, because it's certainly not going to come from the tops of uh, of government, either here or overseas, anything that's going to to mitigate this 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 historically dangerous financial situation. So basically what you're saying is we should get rid of the central bank. We need to default on the debt and we need to reset pretty much everything in this country, which I agree with you. I completely agree with you. And it doesn't seem like Trump is actually going to do this. I he doesn't, he doesn't, I mean, there's no talk about him getting rid of the Fed, you know, defaulting on the debt as of yet. Well, not yet. I mean, he's, yeah. you know, he's like a politician. He'll go to the very end and say, I'm going to make things better. But, you know, again, you know, for a, a so-called conservative, he hasn't really said or done anything different than what Hillary Clinton would do other than, you know, the, the, the modus opera. I mean, you know, he doesn't want to have war with, with Russia. That's one difference. Uh, he but when you look at, for instance, Obamacare or Trump care, it's the exact same thing. His spending plans. What you think Hillary would have done anything different? You think she wouldn't propose a big fiscal spending spending plan? I mean, yeah, she wants. She may have a different tax plan, but ultimately, like you look at all this this Trump care thing. You know, you take away taxes, but then you add other things. So it's just calling it socialism under a different name. So, look, he he's just trying to you know hold things together, just like any any um, political candidate would do. And don't forget, on a personal level. You know, he, I've said this from the beginning. There's, there's very few people in this country who are more heavily leveraged to low interest rates and the continuation of financial market bubbles in him. Because trust me, if interest rates surge ahead right now, the Trump empire itself is going to be in danger. So uh, I think he's and if you look at all the people that he's hired in his cabinet, all these billionaires and Goldman Sachs people that have the same interests as he does personally, uh, you know, considering that he, he said he was going to drain the swamp and you realize he's just a man. Uh, he's a better man than Hillary Clinton is, but uh, but he's just a man. And there's only so much. Uh, and there's I should say there's nothing that any any person could do. The math says that the system is going down and you look at the evidence in front of you. And it is. I just wanted to get into the Bundesbank um, where they've repatriated their gold. And they I mean, the time frame was seven years, but they accelerated the time and they brought in all their gold. Is there a reason that you know of why they decided to accelerate getting all their gold back? Well, the first thing I'd say is I don't believe a word they say. These are chronic liars. These are the worst people in the world. And, you know, Wolfgang Schäble, the finance minister of Germany, is probably the biggest creep of all of them. You know, he's the guy who's always pretending he's Mr. Conservative as he's given out all the bailouts and uh, and, and allowing all the money printing at the ECB. And, uh, you know, so the, the and, I mean, look, Germany's the, the home of Volkswagen. I mean, that, Volkswagen is symbolic of, of, of how much you should believe from the powers that be about their true intentions. So do I I mean, have I ever seen the German gold? that they talk about all this time? Has anyone ever seen this German gold? So why should I believe that, that that they either have it or the Fed has it or that's been transported? But if you take it at face value, the fact that it took, you know, three years to get gold that that should have been in their in their 
faults in a month if it was actually available tells you all you need to know. And what we do know is that the gold they did receive, a lot of it is not the same gold that they gave to the Fed as different serial numbers, meaning that the Fed had encumbered it and then probably scrambled uh, to get it. You know, I mean, my most likely scenario is the Germans see what's going on in Europe and they say, we got to get our gold quick. And they said to the Fed, give us our gold. I don't get none of this is three or four year. We want it now. And so they got different goal that the Fed went out and somehow sourced somewhere else. So, uh, but that's just a guess. I don't know. But the point is, do I, do I believe a word that the Bundesbank says about anything or the Federal Reserve or, or, or the government? Nothing. I don't believe anyone anymore. I believe the people that I that I trust in the alternative media and the people, you know, that have a proven track record of telling the truth. And the German government has about the worst track record of telling the truth of any entity in history. Andy, thank you very much for being on the X-22 Report Spotlight. I really appreciate it. Once again, how can people see your work? Right. Miles Franklin, Precious Metals in our 28th year in business. Uh, I write for free every day at the Miles Franklin blog, milesfranklin.com. 